Have you ever wondered where you really stand with God? Are you overcome with feelings of guilt because of things you've done wrong? Are you tired of religion that focuses on rules that you can't keep? Have we got good news for you? It's time to listen in on some casual conversation with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski and discover what true freedom is all about. This is Growing in Grace. It's Growing in Grace again with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Again. So glad you found us. Growinginggrace.org. Past archived programs are there. And we're in the middle of a series, Why Jesus Taught Two Covenants. You know, series is not a word that we have used a whole lot, Joel, in these uh, many years of doing the Growing in Grace podcast. But we kind of felt like uh, with our short podcast, the, the busy lives that people have, we didn't want to have to do a one, two, three-hour podcast and then do a handful of those. So we'd continue our, our 15, 14, 15-minute podcast here. We're obviously breaking them up a little at a time, but we've been laying a, a foundation for the last four weeks as we start heading toward why Jesus taught the law at times, and other times he would point people to something new and different that would be coming with a different covenant. So we're going to get more into that, I think, as we we uh, have been laying this foundation for a number of weeks now about the law and the commandments and how it all started even back in the garden with Adam and why Jesus ministered in the way that he did. We're, we're, we're kind of getting to that point now. Yeah. And with this whole idea of a series, I mean, what a person can do once we're kind of done with the series is you can't you if you if you want a two or three hour sit down or whatever you could listen to all the podcasts together. Uh, there are some people. I, I'm not the type of person that can sit and listen to something for a long time, like an hour long thing. I don't generally enjoy those unless I'm out on the road, which I do a lot for my job. I like the ten to fifteen minute types of things. But there are people who listen back to back to back, and I think this series would be a good one to uh, give a listen to once it's all done. Uh, and and a lot of people, as it's going, obviously, you listen to one this week, the one the next week, and so on. Yeah, I mean, you could use it in a Bible study or something. You Maybe you meet for an hour, hour and a half, and uh, just uh, chop out our first few minutes of camaraderie. Banter. <laughs> Get it queued up so it's ready to go, <laughs> and, and maybe you, you know, you'd probably end up playing close to t- 10 minutes, less than 15 minutes, and, and uh, give your group time to discuss some of these things. Mm-hmm. That can be a really valuable thing, as as you and I are, are finding out, Joel, when, because you and I do these podcasts, and it's great, but we're also doing a, a class along these lines right now with a, a, a group from church, and it, we have a lot of interaction and, and questions and things that go on during the, the course of the evening. So it's always nice to know what people are thinking. We can't do that on the podcast. Right. That's true. Uh, so one one thing, you know, starting here on, this is this will be uh, part five of this series. We, just briefly, we have we've been trying to set a foundation, as you may know, as to why Jesus taught two covenants. There are two covenants: the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant we talked about the law tree way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We talked about the two covenants from you know from the time from Adam to Moses and and where God made a covenant with the people of Israel. This wasn't a covenant with the people of the world. This was a covenant with Israel, but there was a reason for it, and a covenant has to be agreed upon by at least two parties, and so God didn't force the covenant on the people. They agreed to it. That was week two. Part three, the law shut boasting mouths. If anybody thought that they were righteous by the law, they realized that uh, I guess I'm not really as righteous as I thought. There's 613 commandments in there, and I'm not doing nearly as good as what I probably should. And uh, But there's a reason for that, because nobody can do it. Nobody is ever, no one has ever been able to keep the law. And then uh, part four, last week, we talked about how many people think that the law decreases sin, but when the law came, sin actually increased. And so with that, we'll get into, you know, all of this fits into why Jesus taught the Old Covenant. All of the those things that I just said, you know, the fact that there was the knowledge of good and evil, and that only brought shame to people. The fact that they, they, they agreed on this covenant, they said they would do it. The fact that it only shuts mouths, it stops mouths, it doesn't actually help anyone to justify themselves and that it increases sin. When you read the words of Jesus, like we're going to be getting to, you'll see that Jesus was ministering this old covenant 
to people. A lot of times we'll read, the, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, which we'll talk about. People will read that and think it's a Christian teaching. But with everything in mind that we've talked about the last few weeks, about what the law does, what its purpose was, it's a little easier to understand why Jesus came ministering that covenant. Yes, and that's what he was doing. He was ministering the old covenant. Remember Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law. His parents followed all the ceremonial requirements under that law. He wasn't even named until the eighth days. There was sacrifice that occurred. So, yes, I, I like what you said, though, the great reminder, the law increased sin. The commandments did not reduce sin. Because I know people think, well, don't you think we should try to keep those? Don't you think that, you know, it's good, good not to murder? It's good not to steal? And uh, well, here's, here's another question, though, to try and turn the tables here a little bit and get our, our thinking going in a, in a different direction. If you knew of a minister that was ministering, uh, a pastor who was ministering something that resulted in death, something that brought condemnation, and something that caused people to sin more, would you think they were a very good minister? Probably hmm. not. But that's what the law and the commandments will do. Mm -hmm. And so why would we want to minister that? Right. You don't have to answer. I can't <laughs> hear you anyway. Uh, but. <laughs> Like we were saying, Joel, we can't interact with our podcast audience. I'm just throwing that question out there for you to ponder and think about. So Matthew 5, you, you, you alluded to that. So we got a bunch of stuff in here. We got the Sermon on the Mount. We got the Beatitudes. But this is a good spot here to try and shift our traditional mindset on this being a Christian teaching. And by the way, let me just clarify here. When, when we say some of the things we're about to say, we are not here to diminish anything Jesus said. We're not running from the words of Jesus. We're not trying to say that what Jesus said doesn't matter, that it's it's just all water under the bridge. We're not saying any of that. We're saying let's put this in the proper context right. so we can gain a better understanding of the gospel. And so it, it, it just, for us to be able to say that not everything Jesus spoke was meant for you and me personally. Some people get really offended by that. But I think as we go ahead in the weeks, you're going to see why this is actually a good thing that Jesus was not always speaking to us uh, under the new covenant. And he came first to minister to Israel, who was under the law, under that first covenant. And uh, so this is a good spot to change our mindset, uh, shift from— uh, I, I never used to understand what this was, but 20 years ago, uh, a pastor friend of ours, Joel, uh, that we know and, and kind of grew up in grace a little bit under with his teaching, he, he would say, to, to grasp this gospel, you have to have a, a complete paradigm shift mm -hmm. uh, in your mind. And, you know, he would try to explain that, but a, a paradigm is, is simply a structured way of thinking that will contain basic assumptions that are generally accepted by people within a, a certain community or a circle of people. And so we have these assumptions about certain things with the Bible and the Scripture, and certainly the teachings of Jesus would fall into that. I mean, Jesus starts out with something known as uh, the Beatitudes. That word isn't really in English Bibles, but it just means blessing, to be happy. Mm -hmm. But we usually focus on things like the Beatitudes even, as something that we need to work at, something that apply to us if we do these things. Well, Jesus said, look, these blessings will apply to the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. You have to notice that Jesus said that they would be blessed, not because they were hungry or thirsty, not because they were poor in spirit, but because of what would eventually happen. So uh, when Jesus said, blessed are those who, hu who are uh, hunger and thirst, you're not blessed because you're hungering and thirsting. The reason you would be blessed is because eventually, Jesus said, those who come to me will never hunger or thirst again. And therein lies the blessing. So the ultimate, this has nothing to do with you and me, these Beatitudes. Okay, we, we need to begin to realize this. Our identity in Christ is about being and not doing, and Jesus was the fulfillment of all of those things. He, mm -hmm. he became the king of the kingdom. He became our righteousness, our, our peace, and, and so on. Uh, he, he allowed us to experience the riches of, 
uh, being in Christ. We're not poor in spirit. Those of us who are in Christ, we're not poor in spirit. Why would we be spiritually poor when we've been blessed with his riches? So just throwing out some thoughts here, Joel. Yeah, and that's good. I mean, and just running with, with what you were talking about uh, there, that it's not because they hunger and thirst for righteousness that they're filled, but it's that when Jesus came, he died on the cross and he rose again, and God's righteousness was imputed to us. Was it because we hungered and thirsted for righteousness? No, it's because we believed. All of these things happen to people who believe, not like you were saying, not because they do these things, not because they're merciful, not because not because they act they're in their actions, they're poor in spirit, not because they mourn. They're not mourning so that they will be comforted. They're not meek so that they will inherit the earth. But all of these things happen and are given to us, not because we do these things, <laughs> but because we believe. That's the only thing that we need to do. You know, um, all throughout the, the New Testament, we find that it's the one thing is that we believe. It's those who have faith. And they receive these things, all of these things. Jesus provided them for us. We didn't provide them for ourselves, but Jesus provided these things for us through his finished work. And so ours is the kingdom of heaven. We shall be called the sons of God. We shall see God. We shall. We have obtained mercy. I, I should say these things are, are true of believers. We have been filled. Uh, the righteousness that we needed— whether we hungered and thirsted for it or not, we received it. We were filled with it because of the finished work of Jesus, uh, not because of anything that we did. Yeah, these uh, these programs go by pretty quick. So I don't want to get too deep in here since we're running out of time for this program. But let's keep in mind who, who the audience is here. It's not Gentiles. Now, by Gentiles, what do I mean? Some people, this came up in our class. Some people think when they see a Gentile, they, they think of somebody who's just ungodly, somebody who's just uh, a heathen, uh, an unbeliever. But uh, literally, uh, and, and that could be the case, but literally a Gentile is somebody who is not born of the Jewish race, which, which is almost all of us. Um, so Jesus is speaking to Israel here. There is no evidence that he's speaking to non-Jewish people. Uh, he is speaking. He's not speaking to Gentiles. He is speaking to the house of Israel here, and he's uh, getting ready to place the law before them and teach the law in a way that they had never heard it before. And so as we get closer to uh, moving down the line here in Matthew chapter 5, we'll get into some of that. And it really should be a lot of fun getting into some of that. In fact, a lot of that. There's just so much to say about all of this, Cap. So much to say. And uh, so that's why we're doing this rather long series, longer than anything we've ever done here on Growing in Grace. Well, next week, coming up, you've heard the phrase, you are the salt of the earth. That phrase, of course, comes from the Sermon on the Mount, which we've been talking about. So considering what we've been talking about, with the Sermon on the Mount being Jesus' words to Israel, who did he mean was the salt of the earth? Who was the salt of the earth? Of course, it was Israel. A lot of times today we say that we Christians are the salt of the earth, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. There's a thing in the Old Testament called the Covenant of Salt. We'll get into that next week, right here on Growing in Grace. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. To access hundreds of past programs, visit graceroots.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace.